Um, hello, my name is Frank Mills and I'd like to welcome you all to our annual awards event. Um, this will be uh, an hour long actually today and uh, today we're welcoming uh, Dr. Brian Cox to uh, give us a presentation on, on his uh, career as an engineer and also some of the recent work he's been taking on for our division on uh, competency with Hackett. Um, the meeting will be an hour long. We'll have about a 30-minute presentation and then Q&A. If anyone wants to fire any questions, please put them through the chat box. Uh, and, uh, I will then relay those back to Brian at the end. He'll be pleased to uh, answer those questions. Um, after that, we'll have a, a five to 10-minute period just to briefly sum up. And I will tell you a little bit about the activities of our division. That's Construction and Building Services, which has around 8,000 members of the institution. Um, and I'd like to tell you what we're up to at the moment and what we're planning in the future. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Brian along. He's won the annual award of the CBSD. Now, Brian started his career in the chemical industry with ICI on Teesside and then worked on international projects before joining Cambridge Instruments, Leica, to supply scientific equipment to the semiconductor industry and Sortex Limited supplying equipment to the food processing industry. Brian was then appointed general manager of a large factory in China, manufacturing flour milling equipment, followed by other China-based appointments, leading to managing director of a new China-based manu manufacturing facility for laboratory equipment. On his return from China, Brian set up his own engineering management consultancy. More recently, this included various building services and energy efficiency of projects. Brian is currently representing us on the Professional Engineering Competency Working Group, following up the Hackett Report recommendations on the safety of high rise in buildings. Uh, Brian, please introduce your presentation. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Frank. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And thank you for uh, giving me the uh, CBSD prize. So uh, as many of you know, I've been involved in the um, work following the Grenfell Tower disaster, and particularly on the outcomes from the Hackett report to try and develop a new safety regime. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that the draft building safety legislation is now before Parliament and hope it will not be long before the new building safety regulator gets underway. They will be uh, ultimately part of the health and safety executive. One of Hackett's key messages was about competence in the construction industry. Basically, she said there was an overall lack of competence. And for professional engineers, uh, Hackett suggested there should be what's called a contextualized registration. This means that additional competencies will be required to work on high-risk residential buildings, which we call HRRBs, a sort of uh, chartered engineer plus. But what exactly does this mean? And uh, I'd like to share some ideas from my own career about what competence means for professional engineers and how they might achieve recognized levels of competence. Another theme from the Hackett report is learning from other industries. I think this is a very important one because in the new regime, we're going to be having to produce safety cases and work on a much more professional basis, improving that buildings are safe. Uh, a third uh, item which Hackett brought up is about quality, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So what is, what is competence? What does it mean? Because this is one of these words which is used a lot, but we need to understand what exactly it's meant. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines competence as having the necessary ability, knowledge, and skill to do something successfully. Under the old guilds, uh, three parts of the journey towards competence were recognized as apprentice, journeyman, and master. And uh, that's still used in some trades. And then recently, because I'm a saxophonist, I, I like this, uh, Tim Garland, who's a, max, a master saxophonist, Describe these stages as imitation, that's what the apprentice does, repetition, which is the journeyman repeating the projects again and again, and finally, the master can do innovation, which is 
actually designing new stuff and knowing enough to be able to do that in a satisfactory way. So these are descriptions of the level of competence. The Engineering Council has a document called UK Spec, which is the basis for the award of Chartered Engineer status. And that lists five generic areas of competence. In other words, these are topics as distinct from levels. And they're A, B, C, D, E there you can see. And the IMEC E and other professional institutions have slightly different sets of generic competencies. Uh, the IMEC E we do, uh, again, A, B, C, D, but they are slightly different. And uh, what you should notice about those is in both cases, they have to cover a very wide range of industries, but so from necessity, they are quite general and generic competencies. So when we put together the level of competence and the area of competence, we have like a matrix. And in modern assessment systems, we're usually looking for specific competencies required for a particular role. So the role and the competence are linked in a two-dimensional competence matrix. And uh, for example, if you are applying for the award of Chartered Engineer through the IMAC, you should have a minimum of level two competence in two areas and level three in three areas. And uh, to back that up, you have to need formal education to master's degree level. So uh, we can say that uh, from these A, B, C, D, E, which I'll just go back a second to that, you can see that uh, A and B really refer to what we can call hard skills. That means knowing a particular kind of engineering, for example, whereas C, D, and E are what we might call soft skills, which are more to do with uh, personal communication, to do with management skills, to do with ethics and professional commitment. So um, on the right hand side here, I'm sorry this is a bit small, I hope you can read this. There's some examples of what I call hard competencies. So we could say uh, quality systems, continuous improvement, product management, safety management, fire engineering. These are all hard competencies. And those ones are really quite universal to different types of engineering. On the other hand, I've taken building technology as an example of one which is sector specific. There might be another one might be a nuclear engineer, for example, who's sector specific. And then we have soft competencies, which we've got there. I've put down management, I've put team building, a delegation, customer service, and many others. And also finance and accounting are also, I've called soft competencies. And those competencies can be transferred fairly easily from one industrial uh, speciality to another industrial speciality. Formal knowledge is the term used to describe uh, what you might call paper, paper uh, qualifications. In other words, uh, certifications, degrees, uh, various kinds of CPD. Some people will follow a technical career path, in which case they will have uh, a lot of formal knowledge. Others will move into operational managerial roles, where they tend to have a lot more soft skills. So this combination of formal knowledge, practical skills, and soft skills is an important thing to consider when considering who is right for a particular role. So uh, Judith Hackett said, Dan Judith Hackett said, uh, this industry sector in the construction stands out from every other I have looked at in its slow adoption of traceability and quality assurance techniques. These are in widespread use elsewhere and the technology is readily available. And after the tragic fires at Grenfell Tower and Lagnall House and many others, focus was understandably and correctly on competency fire engineering. However, in most cases, the root cause of the fire has been traced to quality issues. This can be poor quality workmanship, poor quality or inappropriate materials, 
Above all, the lack in most areas of building construction of properly managed quality systems. So, for example, where uh, cladding is taken over, we're getting many reports that under the cladding, the quality of build has been very, very poor and even dangerous. There's a basic reliance still on the construction industry of inspecting quality in. Most industries made this culture change from this approach a long time ago, so that you have to build quality in, not inspect it in. Uh, I'm going to try and show you some examples of the use of systematic quality processes in manufacturing as an indication of what I believe is missing in building construction. So this first example is actually from a flour milling factory, which I ran in China, but it could be anywhere in any kind of big product. And the important thing here is this is a series of products used in a flour mill, which were originally made in Switzerland and other countries, and they have to be to the same quality, specification, color, and exactly interchangeable with products coming from another factory of the same company. So Bula has uh, several factories, and for one particular flour mill, we might get uh, a number of products from this Chinese factory, we might get a number of products from Swiss factory, and so on. And we really have to have interchangeability. So controlling the quality in these overseas environments or even just in a new factory anywhere really, uh, needs a process. It's not enough just to do quality control. We need quality assurance, which means that we know that the product that comes out at the end can be trusted to be correct. So the way we do that is to have a process like this. And uh, when we want to make a new product in an overseas factory, we first of all assemble the new product from a kit of parts supplied from the home factory. So we know all the parts are correct. So the only thing we're doing different is we're assembling that batch of products into a finished product. So the only thing we're doing is assembling and testing. And then before we send that first assembled batch back to the home factory for testing, we will do a final firewall inspection to make sure we don't send any wrong product back. And then when it arrives in the home factory, it gets another inspection, a very hard inspection, to really check that everything is exactly right. When that process is uh, given the tick of approval, then we can start going to local manufacture and some local uh, non-critical parts can be sourced. But still we ship all the product back and we're checking, checking all the time. And then finally, we can go to a locally approved quality process, which means we can ship directly from the overseas factory to a customer. This is a Chinese factory who might be shipping to Australia, Hong Kong, or even the USA, anywhere in the world, really. So this is quite a long process, and uh, this is what you have to do to make sure your product is correct. This is another example. In this case, these are um, multi-station production lines where the product moves along. The one on the left, that's an Avery weighing machine. You may have seen that in your local supermarket. And uh, there's a whole series of installation processes go on before we arrive at the final product. The one on the right is, uh, this is just a bit of a production line for uh, small laboratory equipment. So we can show this as a diagrammatic form as a production line flow with integrated quality control. So at the top, we have uh, the brown line is the production line. And coming in from the top, the blue lines, the blue arrows are the material input after income and quality checks. So we do it in stages. So there's uh, an assembly stage, then there's testing, and anything that's not right is reworked. Then there's another assembly line part and then functional testing again, rework if necessary, and then another assembly to final test, uh, rework, and then finally cosmetic checks. And all the time at the bottom part of the diagram, the quality process is going on. So data is coming in both from the production fault data, which we just talked about, also customer service data on the same products. That's getting recorded. And we're looking at the faults and controlling uh, existing and on order stock. So if we get a problem on the line, 
we look at the material coming in and we will stop bad material coming in. So this is important. We don't want to build in bad material. We're also looking at the root cause. So we say, why is this material wrong? What is the problem? Why can't we assemble it? And then we've got a continuous improvement loop. So that bottom part of the picture is really uh, ISO 9000 quality control part of that process. This process of not building in bad material is a very important uh, quality procedure. And uh, in the original Toyota production system, this was called GDOCA. And uh, it's one of the pillars of their quality system. In the building world, this would be, for example, if there's a quality problem, you have to stop and sort it out. If, for example, you are fitting new doors, or the doors don't fit, we don't want a bodge solution. We've got to stop. We have to put the incorrect material to one side, and we have to sort out the problem. In all the other manufacturing industries, this is almost 100% uh, what people do. But in construction, we really haven't reached this level yet. So this is a slightly different sort of quality control. This is a large welded uh, pressure vessel for chemical industry. Uh, we also assemble these in the uh, Wuxi factory. And uh, these, these are large stainless steel vessels. So in some ways, this is easier because they're pressure vessels and international pressure vessel standards are very well established. So it might be an ASME standard, might be a BS standard or some other standard. And the codes are very well known. And the design will be to the pressure vessel code. The materials are well controlled. So each um, stainless steel plate we receive in the factory will have traceability documentation on it. We can tell exactly where it is, where it's come from. But the real uh, question here is that the final assembly, in this case, depends entirely on the welding quality. And uh, in this case, what it means is that the quality of the overall product depends on the specific skill of a person, in this case a welder, and he must be, he or she must be certified to the correct level. Um, for welders, this is a very well established process. But if we think about a building area, for example, if we have a historic building and we need a stonemason, uh, do we have some process whereby we know that a stonemason is qualified to certain levels? beforehand, it's always done in a kind of apprentice working before the master situation. In the future, maybe we have to go to something like a welder does, which is to repeat his practical examinations every two or three years and prove that he can still do the job he's certified to do. Quality and reliability of incoming materials is obviously a key aspect of controlling the whole process. And uh, what we find frequently is that when we have a supplier quality problem, it often originates further down the supply chain. So for example, we might get a product coming in and we find that it really isn't got the right uh, strength or compatibility with our process. And we find that what's happened is our supplier's supplier has changed the raw material. And this is a very common thing and can happen two or even three or four steps down the supply chain. So controlling the supply chain is absolutely fundamental to getting your overall product correct. So if we're building a house, we need to know that all the things we're going to use to build a house have been checked up and down the supply chain and not just delivered to the site in a kind of unknown fashion. When we have uh, dynamic parts, then we have to have even more data really. So this is just an example from my own background. Uh, this is a, a big pump, which I designed uh, for to go on a high pressure polythene plant in uh, ICI Classics. And uh, when I was there, the pump plant managers were extremely uh, strict. In fact, we had a Glaswegian manager there and there was really no arguing with him. And uh, he said, if you want your pump, uh, I'll leave out the deleted expletives here. If you want to put your pump on my plant, you better go off and test it and prove it can run for 2,000 hours non-stop. And this was my 
early experience of having to have reliability data to present to my customer before I was allowed to put my product on his plant. This is another example. This is where we've got electric motors. I don't know if this little thing will, will work. Uh, no. So um, these are laboratory equipment which are continuously working. So in the laboratory, we often have processes which have to be mixed and stirred for long periods of time. And the motors which run these devices must be good. So we had to source motors and uh, the best motors we could find were ones manufactured for domestic appliances, that means for washing machines and so on. But we found that uh, our requirements really were quite different. We needed very long term continuous running, which is not what you find in a, in a domestic appliance really. So that meant we had to do extra tests and uh, insist on our, our suppliers doing some extra work to prove that their motors could run under our conditions. So this would apply you know, in a, in a building, in fans, in uh, electrical equipment. It would also apply in uh, electronic equipment. So, uh, you know, BIM system, not BIM systems, uh, BSI systems and so on also need to be tested. Oh, there's our little machines working. Um, underneath, underneath all this in the manufacturing area, it's now pretty common and I would say almost universal that companies use ISO 9000, quality standard. Um, I think many people who operate buildings, for example, local authorities and the big housing uh, associations uh, run ISO 45000, which is occupational health and safety. And there are other ISO management standards which are becoming part of operations. But we need really to get the quality standard into normal building work. There are lots of benefits. Uh, for example, transparent ways of working, uh, external auditing, continuous improvement, customer claim, complaint resolution is very important. And generally, uh, working with these standards generates a transparent and open investigation method for product pro problems. So uh, applying these production methods to buildings, if we consider a building, as uh, Chris Regan, who's a structural engineer, said, as a machine, and consider it as a machine, and the building machine is assembled on site from a set of parts, which must all operate together. So it's thought about from that point of view, it's not so different from building another big uh, physically big item. I mean, building a ship, we must say, is probably much more complicated than many buildings. Um, we need the building machine to have excellent reliability for a long period of time. We need everything to work together. We must have quality to support that. That picture there is a picture for recently taken from the Hampton Estate in southwest London. In this case, uh, quality just wasn't there to stop the fire spreading through a wooden frame building. I've been doing quite a lot of work on uh, measuring energy efficiency in buildings and uh, looking at those aspects. And really, I found it very difficult. Um, I did quite a lot of work with the previous green uh, initiative and I came to the conclusion that for new buildings, really the best way is to go towards the passive house or some equivalent of passive house uh, to get the message across that we need a much lower, higher level of uh, quality. In 2019, Goldsmith Street in Norwich, which is a passive house social housing project uh, by Michael Riches and Cathy Hawley, won the 2019 RIBA Sterling Architect Prize. I think this is a very good uh, situation that Passive House is really coming now into the mainstream. What I've done here is to apply the production plan that I showed you before to Passive House uh, air tightness guide guidance. And you can see that in uh, Passive House air tightness, you do 
three, normally three air tightness tests to make sure that the building is really airtight before you pass that building out to occupation. And at the bottom, I've just changed that slightly so we have resident snagging data coming in from other buildings. We have quality data from what we're recording, but we still need the same kind of ISO process for fault analysis and control of existing and on old product stock. We need root cause analysis and we need continuous improvement. So uh, what specific competencies are required by engineers working on high-risk buildings? Well, I think we have to look at uh, high-risk buildings a bit and see what is the life cycle. So uh, a building, initially a new build, generally goes nowadays to the RIBA plan of work and construction under CDM regulations and typically might take two to three years. In the new uh, building safety bill, we're defining three gateways, which are defined as uh, gateway one is a planning application, gateway two is commencement of construction, and gateway three is completion and uh, start of uh, occupation. And then there's a period of occupation and maintenance for say 10 years, followed by a major refurbishment, which may take another two or three years, often done with residents in occupation. So the occupation refurbishment cycle then continues until eventually the building is demolished. And you can see that the new build part of the overall life cycle is really a very small part of a building which might last for 40 to 50 years sometimes. And residential buildings are lasting that length of time. In the new uh, building safety bill, there's a requirement that in future uh, there will be what's called a safety case. I think many industries now are using safety cases and basically what it says is that the accountable person who will be the duty holder, it's more or less the owner of the building, will have to assess the building safety risks relating to their building and take reasonable steps to prevent the occurrence and control the impact of a major incident. And the accountable person will need to demonstrate how they're meeting this ongoing duty through a safety case report, which they will be required to keep up to date. Now, in the new situation, we have an accountable person who is the representative or the owner, and they will appoint somebody called the building safety manager. And uh, when we're talking about roles, we suspect that in many cases, the building safety manager will really be the person who prepares and keeps up to date the safety case. So this is a big job and uh, we wonder really whether uh, the building safety manager will actually be the person who does this work. So the building safety manager and the accountable person are probably going to need some outside help. And we know that in many cases of the bigger organizations, they already do ask people to do external audits of their processes, and I think that will continue. So these are the new housing management competencies which are going to be required. The accountable person, usually the owner, appointing the building safety manager. And I'd like to point out that during occupation and maintenance periods under CDM 2015, if there is no big contractor involved, then the housing management also become the default principal designer and principal contractor. This is a topic that's been widely discussed, but it seems to be correct. When there's a major refurbishment going on, then we would expect as a main contractor and that principal designer and principal contractor will be appointed in the normal CDM way. So this is the same uh, thing again, really. The accountable person's duties will inc include appointing a building safety manager. They will be responsible for producing the safety case and uh, we think this is going to be a big job. We think about uh, 
maybe 6,000 or more high-rise buildings in existence, and each one has to have a safety case, how is this going to be managed? At the moment, we don't really know how the building safety regulator, which at the moment is the Health and Safety Authority, how they're going to manage this large volume of safety cases. And this is one outstanding question we have. So in this diagram, I've tried to show the kind of work which the housing management team is doing on a day-by-day -day basis in the occupation and maintenance situation. Uh, this is a, a dynamic loop. So if you look at the, the little box called action data, here are all the data coming in. So there might have been a fire risk assessment, a structural survey, a fascia inspection, there might have been water testing for Legionnaire, there could have been a fire alarm check, could have been a lift check. We may also have residence requests coming in that something doesn't work. And we also have data coming in from MHCLG with new safety notes and so on. So this information is all feeding into the system and uh, normally will be expressed as a red, orange, green priority list for each building. So here we've shown that we've got an area management situation where the management has uh, three buildings in each estate. They have two estates to manage and they're trying to put together all these different priorities and sort them out. They're then controlled by the internal resource constraint, what uh, facilities they have internally to fix these, these problems or requests. They also have an external resource constraint and these will, con these will uh, include materials as well as people. And eventually they reach the green situation where they've fixed the different problems. We then need a continuous improvement loop going back around to say, how well did we do? And what can we do to improve that? And we can use the Plan Do Check Act, which is a standard ISO system, to see what we could do, what we could plan to do, we could do it, we could see if it works, and then we could act to put it in as a continuous improvement. And the green boxes around the outside are all the management things that the housing management team has to do. So you can see their job is largely dominated by management situations, plus on top of all that, they have their day-to-day -day interaction with the residents, which is also a very time-consuming job, which needs big skills of behavior and other soft skills. So in that uh, situation, they're not really uh, going to be uh, expert engineers in one technology. And normally they will employ external consultants to do fire risk assessments or structural surveys. There are some very big organizations which have their own people qualified for some of these assessments. But in general, they will be using outside specialist consultants, contractors for doing inspections and testing. So this is where we need uh, some sort of uh, external auditing system to see is the action plan, which I've just showed you, working OK? Is the safety case correct? Who is going to do this auditing? So in the uh, railway system regulations, which we call ROGS, R-O-G-S, uh, there's the sense of a person called an independent, competent person. That means somebody who is independent of any work or contracts going on who can come in and say, OK, this is working OK, or it's not working OK. These are the kind of things you need to put right. And this is an important role in the future to make sure that housing organizations are up to scratch. When we have a major refurbishment, we have to realize that very often Doing a refurbishment is actually more challenging than doing a new build. We're trying to uh, bring an existing building up to a current standard in many cases, and that's very difficult and may need a specifically uh, designed engineering solution. For example, to put um, sprinklers into an old building may be really quite difficult, and that will need a particular engineering design to do it. So we believe that in these circumstances, we need to have a role, a new role, which is not really specified in, uh, in the regulations, which we've called lead engineer. 
this is really a principal engineer, really, on the level of principal designer and principal contractor, because we know that very often the engineering design which has to go into a refurb is really quite complicated and needs this coordination of the lead engineer. We also think the people who have previous experience of being lead engineers are the sort of people who can be potential choices as independent competent persons during occupation phases where the building management needs an expert to come and tell them whether they're doing the right things or not. But the independent competent person has to be really independent and cannot be contractually involved in current refurbishment projects and so on. So these are the roles which we believe will be in the future of uh, high rise, high risk residential buildings. So some of these are specified either in the new safety uh, bill or in current construction regulations. In the new bill, we will have the accountable person and the building safety manager. And we think you also need an independent competent person. In this case, person, we mean uh, the legal person, which can be a company or an individual. And then during major refurbishment periods, we believe we will have accountable person who really is the client, uh, building safety manager, an independent competent person, and then we'll have a lead engineer if we need a special design. And we will probably in most cases have a principal designer and principal contractor. So those are the roles which we think we have to look at. And some of these will be filled by engineers. Some of them will be filled by people of other backgrounds, maybe a safety background or a management background. And we have to recognize all these different roles that are going to be in the new building world in future. So at the moment, uh, as a result of all the work that's going on, uh, we've come up with uh, a thing called the Overarching Framework for Competence of Individuals. And this has been passed across to the British Standards Institute, who've now produced uh, a document called BSI Flex 8670, which is available to uh, look at and download on the internet for anybody who would like to be interested. And what is interesting about this particular document is the competence areas which I identified are listed out as fire and life safety, managing safety, knowledge management and communications, buildings and systems, construction products and materials, and ethics. And they also refer to skills, knowledge, experience, and behavior as necessary uh, things to underline these different areas of speciality. So you can see here that four out of five of these requirements are what we would call hard skills. So now we have a different situation that we have the overarching framework coming in with very specific skills, comparing with current engineering approvals for CNG and so on, which tend to be fairly general skills. Sorry. So here I've tried to show how these things hang together. So in the left hand side, you've got the Engineering Council UK spec, and then the particular professional engineering institute like IMACI, IET, and so on, uh, competence requirements. That leads to chartered engineer status, CENG. And then in the middle, you've got a contextualized standard, which will list somewhere between BSI flex, which you've just said is very specific and the Engineering Council UK spec, and there'll be a requirement to uh, comply with that to bring us up to the CNG star or CNG plus for working on HRRBs. There's another, um, we could say, elephant in the room here. Uh, this is uh, shown up by the upper report which was uh, sponsored by the leading engineering institutions. And bearing in mind there are 6,000 tower blocks in the UK and we need all these people. 
This report said that only 15% of qualified engineers are members of professional engineering institutions, and only some 5% are chartered engineers. So where are we going to get all the competent people we need to do the work on these many, many tower blocks? And bearing in mind also that getting tower blocks right is expected to be only the first phase of getting the whole construction industry right. So one way is to look at other industries, as we've seen, and to bring people in from other industries. But it does present a huge problem. So for example, a building safety manager does not need to be an engineer by training if soft management skills are mostly what he needs, but they will need competent engineering assistance. And we'll have to show this in the safety case they present to show that they've done proper look, a proper audit of what's going on and can show that competent people have been involved. So here are some of the routes that I can imagine. This is just my own personal view of things to competence for HRRB roles. So a chartered engineer who's already in the construction sector will need to meet the contextual standard, which is uh, laid down compared to BSI Flex. A seen engineer who's not in construction is going to need some construction industry conversion course. Uh, if somebody is not a chartered engineer, then we're going to need a prior experience route and then a contextual standard. If somebody is not an engineer at all, uh, maybe can do prior experience and then the BSI flex route. So these also have to be worked on and sorted out before we know completely where we are. Uh, the Engineering Council has set up a project now to look at this whole question, and uh, that's an ongoing process that's happening. How do we get ready? Well, I think uh, one area that we have no doubt we all need to be better educated on is fire engineering, and I think we need a suitable fire engineering course available, hopefully online, which we can all uh, take and look at if we think we're going to be involved in the high-risk buildings. I would also like to see a quality system uh, training available. And uh, the Chartered Institute of Building Engineers has done some work recently on this. They've put together a code of quality management and are offering some online quality training for the construction industry. So I think that would be worth following up to anybody who wants that. And finally, I've tried to explain some concepts concepts of competence, particularly with respect to HRRBs, how some ideas from other industries may be appropriate, and uh, how engineers from other industries might be particularly useful in spreading new ideas. I hope this has been useful. Uh, final decisions on competence for those working on high-risk buildings are still to be uh, finalized and discussed, and the safety case process, which is taking a lot of work, will take time to mature. I do believe we're moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. It's been an excellent presentation and uh, very, very pleased to make the award to you this year. They've had some uh, questions arrive and uh, we've got time to take those. Uh, the first one really says, uh, well, it's an interesting one. It, it said, if in the whole uh, process of the Grenfell Tower, people have actually done the right job, uh, actually, the question is, if the correct procedures were carried out in the proper manner by competent people, would the Grenfell fire have actually happened? What's your opinion on that? Well, I think as far as we know, the cause of the Grenfell Tower was a faulty domestic appliance. Um, so that goes back to just domestic appliance quality control, which is another whole area of discussion. But let's uh, suppose that had caught fire, then... There's a whole series of things that happened, and as I understand it, uh, the, the window fitting was entirely wrong, and there were um, flammable materials around the window, which allowed the fire to then progress there. There were uh, poor quality insulation had been filled in because the windows didn't fit properly. So all these things are quality issues. We've heard recently that uh, inspectors are going into uh, tower blocks like uh, Grenfell Tower, which have had cladding fitted retrospectively and found exactly the same problems. So I think I would say that if the builder had had a proper quality system where they inspected 
at intervals through the construction process, and almost certainly before the final cutting went on, that would have definitely helped to contain the fire to within the compartment of the flat. Okay, good. That's uh, good. It does. It does demonstrate we do really need to uh, apply what Hackett is talking about. So I've had a question here uh, from someone that says the, the UK does not have a legally based licensing system for engineers as as there is in the United States and Canada and places. And consequently, we can find unqualified, um, dare I say, incompetent people undertaking skilled professional engineering tasks or maybe overriding uh, what a skilled professional engineer has said or drawn or specified even. Will the work that you've described here um, as part of this engineering council initiative overcome that fault? Well, um, I think that many of us who have been involved in the work on competence have tried to press the case for having licensed engineers. Unfortunately, the um, government has, for not just this government, the governments for a long time have been very against um, the idea of licensing engineers. Uh, this is not really very logical because there are many other areas where people are licensed, uh, doctors and so on are licensed, and uh, even in engineering, people who look after dams and bridges and so on are effectively licensed because they're controlled by uh, a proper system. So unfortunately, it looks like that's not going to happen this time round. However, the Department of uh, it, the department responsible for this said that they are going to put in the guidance that engineers must be properly qualified if they take part in this process. So I think there's still a long way to go on this. Personally, I would like to see licensed engineers, but it doesn't look as though it's going to happen immediately. But I think once um, once the safety case system gets underway, I think that will really force the issue on this. and Hopefully, we will get to this eventually. So I'm sorry, not at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Uh, just remind everybody, there was actually an inquiry into the engineering profession uh, back in the 60s and 70s by Sir Monty Finiston, who did come forward and say to the government uh, at that time, which was a Labour government, that uh, they should uh, register engineers. Um, uh, there was a change of government to Conservative government, um, and the, uh, the the new government, which I think was led by Thatcher, was said, "Well, we don't want this red tape," so we we they dropped the idea. So the finished inquiry uh, did recommend it back back at that time. Um, so just one last question here, but Brian from uh, some members there, obviously members of CBSD, and they're saying that you know really we already satisfied these competency requirements that you've outlined, being chartered and all the rest of it. Um, what, what do we have to do now to demonstrate we can do the right job or we can do it properly? Um, how do we demonstrate competency? So uh, this, this is really, I guess, covers all the members who are in this meeting and any others out there. What, yeah. we, what do we have to do right now to... Okay, so the, pro the proposal is that uh, individual institutions like IMEC, IET and so on will do the assessment and they will assess against this contextual um, requirement and the contextual requirement will require that people have these skills that are listed by the uh, British Standard overarching framework. So that means that uh, somebody who wants to be uh, further certified would go to their own institution and uh, show that they, for example, have uh, qualification, if, let's say fire engineering is an easy one because that's a universal one. Everybody will need to show that they have some training and, exp and expertise in fire engineering and have been on some sort of proper course to understand it. At the moment, the, all the institutions such as IMECI and so on have not yet accepted that responsibility. They're just in the process of uh, negotiating, if you like, with this uh, engineering council as to how this will operate. But that is the proposal from Hackett, and I, I think it will be pretty hard uh, job for Ironarchy and others to refuse to do this. But we do need, as uh, divisions and members of divisions, to press the case for this to happen as quickly as possible. In the meantime, I think if we can find some good courses, so it'd be good to find 
a good fire engineering course we can do, uh, an online quality course we can do, those would be two. Uh, we need to be up to date on the fire requirements of uh, the building regulations, you know, that's B1, B2, B2, B3, etc. Uh, and to be able to show we have those. But I do think we also need to show that we would have some experience of applying these things in practical cases. Um, that, that's necessary so that somebody who comes in from another industry can't just suddenly say, okay, I'll take these paper courses, I've got my CN years ago, I can do it, here I go. So we do need a bit more um, perhaps proving that you have some recent experience in the building industry, building some buildings, which not necessarily tower blocks, but building of suitable complexity that shows your competence. Thank you, Brian. Um, I, I think you might have a different view on that. No, no, I agree. <laughs> uh, I'm just <laughs> going to say uh, thank you very much for a great presentation and for all the work you do uh, for our division. Uh, just so the members know, Brian has been our representative on the uh, hacking inquiry with the Engineering Council, and it's uh, moving forward uh, very positively. So we're, we're well represented, and we've certainly made the right points. And uh, you will find, I think, in the in the springtime, there is a bill going through Parliament. Um, I think it's called the Safety Act, which he was bringing this in legally. So it's important we uh, we are represented, and Brian's been doing that. I'd just like to sum up in the next uh, five minutes uh, on the division's activities generally, and throw an invitation out actually to anyone who's interested to come and uh, join us. Um, you can either join the board. We have a, a, a committee, if you like, which is running division or, or people come and they help with the various events that we're doing and we do represent uh construction and building services division members uh the engineers obviously uh on council and there's a lot happening on council at the moment following the special meeting two years ago there's been a good review of the governance um, and there's an implementation group in place uh, changing the way the institution is working with uh, good policies moving forward so there's a lot of good activities happening and I encourage you to tap into that and that, lots of that is on the website um, we also attend the tsb board which uh, is looking at the strategy for the institution and that has also changed its method of working to develop uh, policies and respond to consultations more promptly so we're much more actively involved in working with our government and overseas we have 25 of the 25 uh, percent of the institution membership is international so that's important we take that into account at all times um, we also uh, were uh, active in setting up the COVID-19 task group uh, under TSB. So it's a, it's a TAC, which is a, a technical activity committee. Uh, we as CBSD um, produced some information which we put on our website, on our section of the website on how to reopen buildings uh, after the initial COVID lockdown. Um, and that is available there for anyone to look at now. But we took that one step further by suggesting all other divisions and groups um, did, did a similar exercise and that's led to something called the COVID manual which you'll find on the website it's uh, it's not a downloadable document it's a website document so you can take sections off it if you want and that's continually being updated but it covers obviously buildings and construction but also aerospace automobiles transportation uh, management processes process power uh, have a good look. It's uh, it's very good. Uh, from that, we've just made a submission to Innovate UK to establish um, a COVID CPD program, which, uh, and, and again, this follows from the work that Brian's been talking about, that we could allow our memberships to get some training, education, uh, registration and certification of competence in the field of engineered infection control. Uh, and that's, I think, very important to, to do that now post-COVID so that engineers can step up and uh, make sure uh, buildings and uh, other systems are safe. So that's uh, been a submission to Innovate UK for some funding because it takes money to set that up. Um, but the UK will be introducing uh, sometime in the new year through that uh, mechanism um, CPD followed by testing, registration and, uh, and a register. Uh, the whole thing would be online as a dial down, so it wouldn't really take people out of the office. They can do it in their own time. 
Uh, we also have an annual award every year. Now, this the one in October was cancelled, as you know, so we're going to have that again next year. But we have the HVAC Prize called the Engart Award. Um, and we also combine with Sibji and Ashray for the Graduate of the Year Award and also the CBSD Prize, which this year went to Brian. Um, Brian's talked about the Hackett Review and we're still working hard on that. Uh, we set up um, <clears throat> a TAC to look at steam frame buildings following the uh, World Trade Center Number no. 7 building collapse and the report by NIST uh, and a more recent report from um, the, called the Halsey Report from Alaska Fairbanks University. Uh, so we're reviewing those because it does have an impact on uh, UK construction as well. Uh, looking at forward at events, I'd like you to draw your attention to a couple that are coming up and they will all be online while COVID is happening. There's nothing happening in the headquarters building, sadly. Uh, we've got a webinar on uh, data centers um, and we've also got another webinar running on buildings reopening with COVID-19 and possibly looking at a seminar on that, which would be a longer event, maybe half a day. Um, we responded to the government's uh, document on district heating or decarbonisation of the heating of uh, buildings uh, and we're also uh, responding to uh, the hydrogen initiative from the government as well. Uh, we took part in the Royal Academy of Engineering's work on sustainability and you will find the report available on our website or downloadable from the Royal Academy on sustainable living spaces. Um, and just uh, finally, just to let you know, we're very active in the healthcare industry at the moment, supporting work by the NHS improvements team, such as the update of HCMO3, which is uh, heat and ventilation uh, and air conditioning for healthcare facilities, and the work they're doing to uh, get to net zero hospitals with the, the ambition of the NHS is to be totally net zero by 2040. Um, so we've been supporting that. So I, I think we're very active. We'd love to be more active and I throw an open invitation out to anyone to come forward um, and let us know and either join our board or at least uh, assist us with some of the work that's ongoing. I think I'd like to conclude our uh, event today and thank Brian very much for a very, very interesting presentation, which will be available on the website to, uh, to go back to and have a look at and, and I think even download, I'm not sure. If you download the whole thing, but uh, it will certainly be available after this uh, event, probably in the next couple of days. Not not straight away, but by the time they uh, process it and uh, make that available to you and any of your colleagues. So please draw their attention to that. So with no further ado and noticing that we're on one o'clock, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, please send in any comments you've got and look forward to um, meeting you in in person, hopefully, once we've got a grip of COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank.